Hi, I'm Doug from Dynamic Computing, and welcome to episode 91 of 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast. There's been lots of exciting things happening in our Amiga community lately. One of the most exciting is the release of a brand new display enhancer for our ECS and OCS machines like the Amiga 500 and the Amiga 2000 called the RGB to HDMI. A lot of you have seen videos on it or heard about it on Facebook or Twitter. I'm here to show you a little bit more about it right now. Now this thing has apparently been available for other machines for a period of time, but uh, you know, other lesser machines means nothing to us. If it's not about the Amiga, we don't want to hear about it. The magic happens when you add a Pi Zero to this little device. Let me show you a Pi Zero. It's one of these right here. It's a Raspberry Pi with a 1 gigahertz CPU and 512 megabytes of memory. And this is what does the heavy lifting for this new display enhancer. Now, it's just amazing the little device like this with 142 times the processing power of a bog standard Amiga and 100 times the memory of a standard Amiga still is considered only a, an add-on, an addition to our absolutely wonderful platform. Now, to add on and give capabilities to our little Pi Zero, we need a Denise adapter board, like this one right here. If you can see that little guy, and I actually have my little Denise chip on there right now. Now, this specific board was made by our good friends at Retro Rewind right here in North America. Now, you can make these yourself, absolutely, and I'll have the GitHub page linked in the description where you can get the bill of material and build one yourself. Um, pretty cheap, actually. But if you're like me, you're the kind of guy who doesn't have the time, the patience, and uh, honestly doesn't want to burn the neighborhood down trying to solder on uh, little tiny parts, it's worth it just to spend a few extra bucks to buy one pre-assembled and tested. Just an important note, when you get on Retro Rewind's website, all the prices are in Canadian dollars, so don't be shocked at the prices. If you see something like this for 40 bucks, you do the exchange rate, it's actually like 32 bucks. It's quite a bit less. And there are some uh, discount coupons also available that uh, you can get from, uh, just look up the Amigos or This Week in Retro, and they've got a couple cool discount codes. And also, being Canadian, I'm sure he accepts Molson beer, maple syrup, or even hockey pucks as payment. Now, it is a fairly simple device. Basically, it fits in your Denise socket. You can see the, the, the little uh, socket for the Denise. Denise plugs right in there, and then the Pi Zero slots right into this GPIO header right there. The whole thing took like 30 seconds, 45 seconds to pop it all together. This works with either the standard 8362 OCS Denise chip or the 8373 Super Denise chip that's used for, for ECS graphics. There's a little jumper right on the bottom that you select which Denise chip you want to use. Now, if you accidentally select the wrong one, you're not going to damage anything, but the display will just not look quite right. The pixels will be off. It just doesn't, the clock doesn't work quite right. It works fine in all NTSC and PAL modes that OCS can normally handle, 320 by 200 up to you know 640 by uh, 512 in PAL mode. Uh, it does not work properly with some of the multi-scan modes like double PAL or double NTSC. It just doesn't work properly, but I have tested it and it does work on the 1280 by 200 and 1280 by 400 ECS modes, and it looks okay that way. Getting the software onto this Pi Zero on here is really what we need to do to get it working. If you notice right here, there's a little micro SD slot. You download the software right from the GitHub page, again in the description. Put it on a micro SD card. It's like 30 megabytes, so you can use the smallest SD card that you can find. And plug it in and it just works. You don't need to do any configuring or anything of this little guy when you want to just use it as a basic display enhancer. Now let's take a look how we install it in an actual computer. This week I'm going to be using again my Amiga 500 in my Checkmate case from Stephen Jones with the vampire in it. Let's take a closer look. Now on a normal Amiga 500 motherboard you're not going to have any issues at all. You're going to have the Denise 
right here that you've grabbed and taken out and put right in the RGB to HDMI and you're just going to plug the whole thing in there and just be done with it. Myself, I've got a unique situation. I have a Vampire V2. You guys have all seen my video on it. If not, there's the link. And if you've seen it, you know I also have a mega chip, two megabyte uh, Fat Agnes board right here. So I had to actually boost the size of the Vampire by putting a couple of 68,000 uh, sockets right there to get the height up. The problem with that is now the RGB to HDMI is a real tight fit right in here. You'll see it when I plug it in in a second. And the PSU socket gets in the way just a little bit. Let me plug it in and I'll show you just what I mean. There is one more thing I need to mention and that's this nice two pin header that you see, a uh, bent pin right there. Now this can be totally unused if you don't wanna use it, but you can plug in a standard button onto this, like this little guy right here. And that just has a little uh, female connector on it, plugs right in. You see I have an extension cable on mine. Uh, while I could mount this button, drill a hole and mount it right there in the back of this little 3D printed thing, I don't really want to do it because with my desk I'd have to try and finish, reach behind and push it and it's just hard to do. So what I did, I just have it on an extension cable coming out the back and then I'll find a creative place to put it. I'm thinking maybe one of my floppy slots here, maybe the little hole here. I'll figure out something clever to do. But again, you absolutely do not need the button. It is completely optional, but it does add some cool features like we're going to see in a few minutes. Now, when the RGB to HDMI, which is right here, is plugged in, looks like we've got plenty of clearance. Everything looks just fine and dandy. Make sure you get it plugged in the right way with the little notch on the chip pointing to uh, in, the, in the proper direction. But what I run into because of the elevated position of my vampire is this HDMI cable right here where the HDMI cable plugs into is so close to the vampire. If I plug it in, it hits these little uh, hoodads right here and blocks them. Okay, so it, it, it just doesn't uh, fit properly. So what I find I have to do is just move this guy up a little bit out of the socket just a tiny bit but not enough to disconnect it and then my vampire and my RGB to HDMI fit in perfectly. Again, with your machine, you probably won't have this problem because you're probably not elevating your vampire if you even have one or you may not be doing it in a checkmate case. Now you may be thinking, Douglas, why don't you just elevate your Denise socket a little bit like you did on your vampire? Well, then the ATX power supply gets in the way. There's no clearance here, so I can't raise that up anything. Now the two solutions I could use are a Denise relocator, which I believe I've seen, or a 68,000 socket relocator that locates at 90 degrees, and then I would have plenty of room. Let's get her plugged in and you'll see it still works just fine. Now you see with my HDMI cable, which is sold separately, it doesn't come with one, uh, plugged in, it still hits the vampire a little bit, but it's not causing any damage. There's nothing there, it's pressing down on too hard. And we still have good physical contact with the RGB to HDMI board. Again, you're not gonna run into this unless you have the specific setup that I have. As far as HDMI, the mini HDMI plugs into here and I just have a mini HDMI to a standard HDMI connector, a female right here. And I've got it mounted with a 3D printed mount here from my friend David Z and plugs right in there. Then I can just plug an HDMI cable right into the back. It works absolutely perfectly. On an Amiga 500, you will need to find a way to creatively mount an HDMI cable on your computer without ruining the case. You know, maybe get a nice flat cable, run it out the back, run it out one of the unused ports. There's lots of creative ways to do it. Now we have the adapter board mounted, the HDMI plugged in, and I've bypassed the RTG on the Vampire for this test. 
So we've booted it up and we're in a rock solid 640 by 200 pixel mode. So standard Amiga high res. Now everything looks big because I'm usually in RTG. So I have everything uh, the, the size of the fonts enlarged, but you can see absolutely rock solid display, not a drop of flicker, not a drop of pixelization or anything. Let's take a look at some higher resolution displays. We're gonna go into our prefs and, geez, these icons are big, aren't they? Screen mode. We're gonna to go to high res interlaced. Now, as you know, we'd normally get flickery, flickery video in interlaced mode, but take a look at this. Absolutely rock solid 640 by 400 interlace mode, not a drop of flicker to be seen anywhere. Now this will handle all of the OCS resolutions just fine. So our, our uh, uh, low res, just look at this, this will be crazy. <laughs> low res workbench, that is absolutely insane, but works absolutely perfect. If we want to look at the high res, super high res, these are 1280 by, by uh, 400 modes, plus some overscan. Those work okay too. So you can see we've got the, uh, the uh, right now this is actually at 1440 by about 460 resolution, but it works just fine, totally flicker free, everything works okay. Now what does not work are the double scan and the double NTSC modes. So if we tried those, let's see, ignore our retargetable graphics. Yeah, I don't even have those uh, as an option here, but what happens is it tries to scan them at 31.5 kilohertz, does not work. Let's take a look at the device in action and see just what it can do.
Not too shabby, eh? I mean, it, everything looked absolutely perfect. Now, let's see what this little magic button that I've got on here can do. Give it a press, and it comes up with a menu. And in this menu, you can do creative things, like if you uh, press down with two short presses and then one long press, you go into the preference menu, and you can do things like turn off scan lines, because only a monster uses scan lines on an LCD display. Don't be a monster. Uh, some of these other things, you can, you can zoom in, change some of the scaling. Uh, we'll go back down, long press to return. Let's go into the settings menu. From the settings menu, you can do things like overclock the Raspberry Pi. Now there are certain instances where you may want it to go a little bit faster. If you're pushing it maybe with some, uh, some overscan modes like I do, you can overclock the actual Pi. The guy who created this particular implementation, Copper Dragon, who I've uh, referred to on my description page, says that it's pretty safe to overclock it by 40 megahertz and then maybe overclock the, f the core by 120 to 170 megahertz. Uh, just makes everything run just a little bit better. Geometry menu is very useful because in here you can change your settings for max width and max height. By default, these settings are at about 706 or maybe 712. This one's at maybe like 220. That's the amount of overscan that you can theoretically even set this to. But I find I can set it even higher. I can go to a higher overscan like 768 wide, 240 high, which 240 times two is 480 uh, when you interlace it. That's really, really useful right there. In the main menu here, you can change the HDMI mode. You don't bother with that. You can theoretically change the refresh uh, rate. This is important here, scaling. I like things full screen on my LCD displays, as you can see, because half of you are just right now crying about the aspect ratio. But you can hold this down and change it to a more of a four by three display. We'll change it to a nice four by three soft. Now, if you want to test these settings, just go ahead and go up here to return. If you need to reboot the Pi, which does not reboot the Amiga, the Amiga stays fine and running, it just reboots the Pi and then redisplays it, it will tell you it has to reboot the Pi, and it will warn you that if things come back and they look funny or they don't work, it gives you instructions on how to actually reset the Pi. Here we're in a nice uh, uh, four by three aspect ratio, so all of you can calm down. It supports four by three aspect ratio just fine. Once you've got settings that you're happy with and they work, you can just go down here to save configuration and it'll save it for the next time. Now, if you find that you've maybe set your overscan too high and you need to remove it, instead of going and having the numbers go up every time you press the button, go to this button reverse down here, select that, and then everything goes in reverse. So then numbers will start to go down when you make choices on here. For example, there's 768. Now when I go to change this, instead of the numbers going up every time, the numbers actually go down every time. So you'll need that little trick because we only have one button to make the changes here. Now you guys will know from watching my channel that if I find a problem with something, I'll be straight up and I'll be up front with you and tell you about it. The only real issue that I find with this whole technology is its ability or inability to switch between NTSC and PAL modes. Obviously, mine is an NTSC mode because it is by far the superior technology to the inferior PAL. But a lot of our friends out there need things in PAL, and a lot of us over here in this country like to switch to PAL so we can take a look at some of the nice demos and some of the games that were only available in PAL mode. Now with most of my other solutions, like my RGB to SCART, or my RGB to Component, or my RGB to VGA that I've gone over in my upscaler video here, you switch over to SCART, as long as the monitor supports it, boom. I'm sorry, you switch over to PAL, and as long as the monitor supports it, then boom, it displays in PAL. Now every once in a while I might cut a little something off the bottom, but it absolutely works. With the RGB to HDMI, while it claims it supports PAL, I can never get it to work properly. Take a look at what happens. 
If we switch over to a nice PAL mode here, let's go screen mode, let's go PAL, high res laced. All it does is blink on and off all day long like this. You can still see it there. I mean, it's obviously displaying something, but it just blinks and blinks. And I don't care if it's a PAL game or whatnot. Now, I talked to a couple of guys who are a lot smarter than me, and they say, yes, it will work in PAL mode. If you switch it over to PAL mode in the startup menu and you switch it over in Workbench and then you go in and you start fiddling with some of the modes and you switch it to 50 hertz mode and then you tell it maybe you could switch it to 60 hertz PAL mode. You know what? We need to be able to just say this is PAL, this is NTSC, boom, switches over like all of the other devices that I use. And I'll tell you the truth. I tried all of their recommendations for switching over to PAL mode. I can't get it to display on anything. And I know my monitors support PAL mode because I use it all the time with my other upscalers. Hopefully this is just a software thing and it can be correct, corrected so you can easily switch between NTSC and PAL mode without having to fiddle with the buttons and without you know work, uh, praying to some strange god or something like that to get it to work because that's one of the beauties of the Amiga is how easy it is to switch between NTSC and PAL just like that with a couple of little mouse clicks and we need to be able to carry that on with this new product. Now if anyone has got it working and working easily without jumping through flaming hoops please let me know in the comments below so I can try it because I've tried everything everyone's recommended I can't even get it to go into PAL mode and give me a normal looking screen. Now there's also a version of this that's designed for the Amiga 2000 that, that fits right in the Amiga 2000's video slot. Works just great, and it does not require you to remove your Denise chip. You just put the Pi right on top of this device, and you've uh, got your little uh, HDMI connector here. It's got a button integrated with it, Super Denise button. Just great. Mine had a specific issue, and Kevin and I did some troubleshooting. We think we found the, uh, the solution for it. He's sending me a replacement board uh, that should fix the little problems I'm having. But in general, these work great, and I'm going to do a whole video on it in a week or so when I get my new boards in. Now, for those of you who already have something in your Omega 2000's video slot, like a video toaster or a Genlock, you can use the standard Denise version of the chip without any problems at all. It fits right in there, you just take your Denise out, etc. But it sits high enough where the top of the Pi Zero just barely touches the bottom of the power supply. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is put some kind of insulation over the top of the Pi Zero to keep it from shorting out if you use the Denise socketed version on an Amiga 2000. Also works fantastic in an Amiga 3000, but I can't for the life of me figure out a reason why anyone would do it. The thing's got the amber chip and the thing's got a VGA on it. All of these modes and more already are rock solid on an Amiga 3000. This just just seems to be superfluous when in an Amiga 3000, but it works. Amiga 600, in theory, this technology will work fine. In reality, it requires a couple of bodge wires and a special kind of connector to connect to it. Now, Frank from Retro Rewind has told me he's made a few of these connectors. He has his Amiga 600 working with it, but when you sell something like this and you say, yeah, okay, you got to solder five different places on your board, and suddenly it's, you know, you, you worry about selling it and whose fault is it if somebody fries their product. So they're working on it. They'll probably get something figured out so it works better with the Amiga 600 with fewer solder points or maybe none. We'll wait and see. AGA is out of the question. This little Pi board can't handle 24-bit graphics, okay? The 12-bit graphics that the Amiga supports, 4096 color, handles that just fine. 4-bit planes, 5-bit planes, ham 6 modes, no issues at all. Everything works great. Throw AGA into the mix, it can't do it. Now, I have seen on the Facebook group and my pal Manuel Jesus, uh, who you know uh, is a member of the Vampire team, he says that He's had it working in his Amiga 4000 and his video toaster. It just 
kind of downgrades the colors of AGA a little bit, down to 12-bit colors, but it functions fine for a second monitor while he's using his main monitor for his video toaster stuff. I don't recommend it, but the theory is sound. So is this worth the 50 or $60 you're gonna end up spending on this? Heck yes. The, the only way I can get a signal as clean as this out of my Amigas, honest to goodness, is with the RGB to component adapter that I've reviewed right here. Then you get this absolutely gorgeous, high color, beautiful display, but you still deal with the interlace flicker. It's so far superior to the RGB to SCART to HDMI solutions. Those work great, they work great for playing games, but you use that in Workbench. And while it does kind of deinterlace the screen, uh, you move things around and you can see like this flicker and this pixely stuff flickering around. And the colors of this are so much more vibrant. I mean, take a look at Kevin Quattro's picture right here. It's gorgeous in ham six mode. Uh, the colors are so vibrant, the, co the, the sharpness is so good. It just beats most of the other solutions. Now, is it better than an Indivision MK2 or MK3? Now, that depends. This handles overscan better. On my MK2 and my Amiga 1200, I can't get more than maybe uh, 650 pixels of overscan. Here, I can go to 736 or 740 or 756 pixels of overscan. And I use it a lot. So this has better overscan where the Indivision maybe is a little bit better because it brings out some of the less common screen modes and you're still able to use those just fine. If you need a rock solid display on a television or on an HDMI monitor, this is a really good quality and inexpensive way to go. They get that PAL issue figured out where it's super easy to switch between PAL and NTSC. This thing is a no brainer. Thanks to my wonderful patrons for supporting me. I really appreciate it. You see this beautiful high resolution, non-interlaced uh, list of my wonderful patrons right here. If you'd like to join up and help me with this channel and help the channel continue to grow, pop on over to patreon.com forward slash 10 mark and you too can be part of this illustrious high resolution ham six list. Thanks for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Please like and subscribe and follow me on Twitter. Check out retrorewind.ca. He's got so many cool things there besides just this uh, RGB to HDMI. Take a look at the discount codes available from uh, This Week in Retro or Amigos Retro Gaming. Use one of their discount codes. Get yourself another 10% off this stuff. Why not? But until next time, this is Doug from 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast, signing out.